you want to be able to imagine the future world instead of being like, oh, bears are dying. We're all going to die. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Everything's terrible. You drove a car. You're a really bad person because you drove a car and you just ate a hamburger. Like, oh my God, you ate a hamburger. I am never going to be your friend again. You know, it's a lot of like people can get in that mindset. You want to move out of that and start imagining in a hundred years, what world do you want? Mm-hmm. You know, if you want, one of my favorite things to think of is a world that's covered in like green cities, like covered in trees. So if you were to fly a plane over the city, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the forest and the city because it would be covered in vegetation, right? Mm. So, and that's a a real thing that actually has to happen for us to survive. We need a lot more plants, plant life in cities. So I think about, oh, you know, cities would be covered in green roofs and then, um, you know, children would grow their own fruit and vegetables at school and, or maybe everything, you know, just, you just cast your mind into an imagination space of the beautiful future positive reality. Mm. And, that's a, a critical thing to do to create um, optimism and a vision and to get ideas from. Yeah. And, you know, since I learned how to do this, since I started doing this, my just whole headspace is different. I used mm-hmm. to be more in the other way of thinking. That's kind of how you start. We all start in that. Yeah. And then I started thinking about like, wow, imagine if I just walked down a city street and there were just cherry blossoms everywhere and there was art and there was children playing and there were no cars anymore and trash had gone extinct and there were every building had a little forest on top of it. I'm like, that would be amazing. That's the world I want to build. And you just get into a completely different headspace and get this really positive energy. And you mm. start coming up with ideas, you know, better, better ideas of what to do. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the creative loop that you want to be in with vision and optimism to change the world. That's your creative space you want to be in. And that's why you can't save the world without entering into a creative process. It's one and the same thing. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. At Traditional Medicinals, we're thrilled to announce our new line of energizing black teas, Our herbalists have blended organic Assam and Darjeeling black tea with beneficial herbs and spices to create revitalizing, refreshing, and invigorating teas. Sure to put a little pep in your step. Find all our new teas at Whole Foods or order online using the code WELL20. Traditional medicinals. It's amazing what a plant can do. Katie, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So uh, I came across your story because you wrote in and you sent me a copy of your book, How to Save the World. And I just, you know, I, I, as I was going through the book, I couldn't, you know, help but think, wow, there's so much in here that is like super tactical and actionable and incredibly relevant to creative people. But um, before we get into all of that, uh, I want to start by asking you, where in the world did you grow up and what impact did where you grew up end up having on the choices that you've made throughout your life and your career? Okay, that's a really big question that I will try and put into a, a nutshell. Uh, I was born in Chicago, but I moved to Australia to Australian parents as a baby. So I'm a dual American Australian uh, citizen. But I grew up in a lovely part of Australia called the Mornington Peninsula. That would possibly be like the Santa Rosa equivalent. I just assume everybody knows the places in California. A uh, beautiful natural area, and I was very bonded with nature as a child. I loved to draw flowers. I got brought up in a, a really creative household. My grandparents have German grandparents. My grandmother was a fashion designer, and my grandfather was a graphic designer. And back in those days, that meant illustrating everything yourself. So my grandmother was a a masterful illustrator. We had to draw the whole figurine and the face and the different poses. And my grandfather being a graphic designer back then, they didn't have computers, so they had to do everything by hand. You had to draw the fonts. They had to, he could paint a photorealistic portrait on a billboard. And so growing up in that influence, just being able to be technically masterful with drawing and creativity and making as well, because fashion is a three-dimensional making process, that was core to my upbringing. And then I got interested in science uh, and engineering and sort of math. I sort of had a bit of a... um, a bit of a strength in that. And so I got really interested in science. But then as a teenager, I was a teenager in the 90s. 
there was a lot of environmental activism from <laughs> Greenpeace type of groups back then. You know, we saw whales with harpoons in them with blood on the news every night. There was the um, Rwandan massacre and the Ethiopian famine during that time as well, where you saw skeletal children on the nightly news every night. Um, and then you would hear about um, <sighs> the Amazon being cut down and deforestation and toxic chemicals in food. There was a whole lot of environmental marketing activism going around that time. So as a young you know, 13 or 14-year-old, that really deeply affected me as I was a, a sensitive, creative child who liked to draw flowers and write poems about whales. The idea of a whale being killed was so upsetting to me or a tree being cut down. I was instantly drawn to environmental activism very young in my, in my early adolescence. And it just went on from there. I went and studied environmental engineering and got into the, you know, the technical job of trying to build a sustainable city and was involved in it was sort of fringe punk activism as well. But I always had a foot in the, the real technical business world of sustainability. And yeah. that ended up taking a stronger path. I ended up working in corporate sustainability. Started my own media company called Green Pages in Australia, which ended up being quite successful. I had about 15 to 20 full-time employees. It was a really fun time in Australia. I tried to rebrand sustainability to be really fun and fashionable and progressive, you know, out of the dark ages of lentils and dreadlocks and uh, where it was seen as this very weird fringe thing. I wanted to make it like Chanel. I was like, we're going to Chanel this movement, make it really cool, make it as cool as Nike. So I went on this mission to do that that was really fun. And then uh, the media started moving more towards technology, and that really drew me to Silicon Valley. Um, in about 2010, I moved here. Uh, and then I really sort of regained my tribe of people with the deep nerd scene in Silicon Valley. Suddenly I was around people who made math jokes, and everybody had a PhD in something really obscure with machine learning. And the whole um, kind of the, the spirit of Silicon Valley, that energy, not just the kind of become a billionaire thing, but the actual the nerdosphere in Silicon Valley, I totally resonated with about people hooking up sensors and measuring things and writing code and building new frameworks. And I totally resonated with that community. And I've been there ever since in that, in that scene, uh, which took me into this, um, this passion for environmental data and environmental change. So there's not many people that cross over between uh, environmental engineering uh, like mm -hmm. environmental change and the Silicon Valley technology scene. Yeah. People in Silicon Valley tend to be very much into deep technology. So, the, But there's a few of us around. Uh, so it's a really fascinating thing to work in that nexus between how do we actually save planet Earth and how do we use the whole Silicon Valley technology and spirit uh, to do that. And my book came out of studying that and also studying the behavioral science of how you create change because I've been obsessed mm -hmm. with how to save the world my whole life. Yeah. And uh, I realized there's a huge gap between everybody knows what we have to do. We have to cover the world in solar panels. Yes, we have to stop cutting down the Amazon. Yes, we have to stop taking all the fish out of the ocean. But you know what? Nobody, even at the highest levels of, you know, of the EPA and the government and big not-for-profits, people still really don't know how. They're like, yeah. yeah, okay, you want to cover the world in solar panels? How? And everybody's kind of stumped about how to do it. So yeah. we have to look into the next phase is in social influence, and that's where the behavioral sciences really come in. So. Half Silicon Valley, half behavioral science. That's kind of where I think environmental change is really at right now. That's what my, my book, How uh -huh. to Save the World, really draws on that. And then here we are today. Wow. It, it's funny because, you know, when I, when I read the book, I, you know, I, I knew there were parts of this whole environmental science idea. But I, as I dissected this book, I think I really appreciated the fact that, you know, as you pointed out, it's, you know, based on a, on a lot of science of behavioral change. Uh so a couple of questions come from that. I think that the thing that interests me is that this isn't necessarily the seed that was planted very early on in your life with your parents and, and your grandparents. It sounds like it sounds like you have this really creative side. And I wonder what this artistic part of your background has allowed you to bring to building technology solutions. Um, like what have you brought from that to the work that you do today? Well, I've actually thought about this a lot because I've always wondered like, why am I so kind of intensely creative and my other world of sustainability professionals, environmental engineers tend to not be. And the sustainability industry is a bit of a dearth of creativity. It's quite sad. Everybody's very nice and very well-educated and smart, but creativity and design is not a big part of the scene. So I'm a bit of a outlier in that community. And I've often thought about it and I thought, I think when you get trained as a young person, as a child to, to make stuff, it's the essential creative process of being able to imagine something in your uh, in your mind 
And that's actually called in technical terms the positive constructive imagination. That's what it, you might have heard that term before. I don't know. Mm, yeah. uh, you actually are able to create a complex mental uh, vision of what you want, like a building or a dress, whatever. And then you get to work of practically making that happen. So you're constantly in this parlay or this iteration between the, the mental model and the physical act of making in this rapid kind of trial and error uh, cycle. Mm. And that's essentially the creative process, imagining, making, imagining, making. And so when you get brought up doing that, and this is why putting art and design in school is so important, then everybody's focusing on like STEM, STEM, STEM. I'm like, yeah, sure, I have STEM training, but... You have to be able to imagine something like, okay, I want to take a photograph. I want the photograph to look like this. And you can imagine it in your mind. And then you go through and you figure out how to use the camera and you study tutorials and then you actually do it. A whole lot of people, they're not imagining. They're not in the process of imagination. Yeah. And then they're not trained that, you know, you can actually figure this shit out. You can just do YouTube tutorials. You can read the manual. And if you spend a day on it, you can do really good quality photography if you, if you learn. Um, so even just like dressmaking, you know, like cutting little bits of fabric out and sewing them together, you're working with that three-dimensional space. Yeah. But the more stuff you make, you're also able to build your confidence up to basically say, I imagine that, I'm going to go out and make it. Mm-hmm. But part of it's cerebral, but part of it's just your personality that you actually have the confidence. I mean, I have friends all over the place that say, well, I'd really like to build like a community garden or I'd really like to build a roof garden or something. And you've really got to have some sort of power or confidence inside you Mm -hmm. to be like okay now i'm gonna really make it happen in real life and that you Mm -hmm. can be in that in that process so i think that creative upbringing i had was absolutely core to being able to just have an idea and then be like yeah i'm gonna do it just gonna just gonna do it i I love that you know it's funny you you mentioned that i was thinking uh you know i started doing searches for smart mirrors a few weeks ago and i was like fuck these things are really expensive (laughs) and so i was like wait a minute and then then i found a tutorial for like a diy smart mirror for you know like about 150 bucks, you can make one of your own. And I was like, okay, this involves a lot of soldering and hardware and things that I don't know anything about. But there's a tutorial on YouTube and the girl who made it didn't necessarily look like a computer genius. She just made it. And I thought to myself, okay, you know what? This might be an interesting project. Um, you know, and and it, like I realized, I was like, okay, nothing here looks particularly complicated. You know, it, it's, you know, like you said, figuring it out. So, you know, I, I know you mentioned that you're a parent and I wonder based on this perspective, like what is your view on the education system? Uh, in its current form. Oh, well, I don't know if I'm totally qualified to talk about that. And I probably will just say something that I don't, I'll just put a qualifier saying I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, and my child is also only four years old. Yeah. So she's not in elementary school. She's just in preschool. Yeah. But so I don't, I don't know anything about children over the age of four. Basically. Well, you also live in a, my, in a city <laughs> where apparently kids have to be on like waiting lists for schools for the moment they're born, from what I'm told in Silicon Valley. Uh, I don't know about that, but they, yeah. uh, there is a lottery system. I haven't gone into it yet. I'm just about okay. to go into it, so I'm not quite sure. Um, but I do have a few thoughts on on parenting that are a bit uh, a bit unique. And one thing that I I have a very strong willed child, but she very much has her own personality. She's hard to control. She's fiercely <laughs> energetic. She is more wolf than child. I always want to say literally, but it's, I don't like to use that word incorrectly, but she is so wolf like. It's like she's, she's like nuclear powered, right? I've never met a child that's more energetic and more kind of forcefully her own person. And I just look at this child who's just so, um, has so much personality and so much dexterity and physicality. And I just think it's not my job to squish her. Like my job is to just make sure everything's okay. Basically food, shelter, kind of clean, eat some, you know, eat some stuff, doesn't die, doesn't get injured. And that she's going to work it out on her own. Like she will, she's so self-directed. She will go in her own way. And I think that's just a, a bit of an overall view of people that you can, an overall worldview to nurture the spirit within and mm-hmm. let the spirit within figure it out on their own rather mm-hmm. than top down micromanaging. And this goes in schools and companies and the ways that we view uh, social justice and not for profits as well. You start to see it everywhere. This sense of like, Oh, like here's some like poor homeless people or here's some people in an African village. Let's go and like force ourselves on them, you know, force what we think is best for them rather than just think, well, let's just give them like a little bit of support kind of at the root of who they are or their infrastructure 
and just let them grow because we trust that inside them is like an acorn, like a seed, and that will grow into their own tree. And we don't want to like squish the tree. We want to like really see what the tree can be if we kind of like stand back and let it and let it grow. Mm-hmm. And so I would really lean towards a type of educational model that just kind of like does a, a minimalist kind of working around the child. Mm-hmm. Rather than this very top-down structural, we need to fit you in boxes kind of thing, it just sort of encourages some very basic principles and gives them the basic tools and lets the child flower in their own way, in their own self-directed, in the self-directed way that they want to do. Yeah. Mm, wow. Well, I, I think that makes a, a perfect segue to the book itself, uh, which, you know, like I said, I, I think that just we could spend probably three hours talking about the content in this book because it was so packed with so many actionable insights. Um, so I mind mapped it because I was like, this is the only way we're going to get through the amount of material in here. But I think you open it by by talking about this idea of the biggest mistake when it comes to any sort of idea. And you basically give us four sort of Um, core ideas around the mistake that we make, the value action gap, the information deficit hypothesis, effort versus results, ideas first and data second. Can you define what those are and how they apply? Uh, Yeah, the biggest mistake, the value action gap, which basically nobody's ever heard of. And I hadn't heard of it until I'd been doing this stuff for 15 years either. Uh, It's really fascinating and everybody makes it, which is that when you want to change the world, maybe you want to plant trees or you want to stop climate change or you want to help plastic in the ocean or you want to get kids in schools to eat more vegetables, everybody assumes that if you just learn about an issue, then people will just change, right? Uh, and people will care. And if they care, so the, the error is that if we know about something, people will change. And if we get people to care, uh, people will then change. But mm. this is actually quite easy to study through the academic method. You can take 50 people, you can show them a documentary, Uh, you can then, and you can test by a little quiz, how much they know, how many parts per million in the atmosphere, how quickly is the carbon going up, whatever it is. And then how much they care, how, um, scale of one to 10, how emotionally concerned are you about this issue? And people can be very emotionally concerned, but that does not translate into behavior because behavior is a completely different beast to getting somebody to intellectually or emotionally resonate with something, right? So yeah. then if you're looking at someone who actually has to, are you going to buy the electric car over the not electric car? Are you actually going to quit smoking? Everybody who smokes knows how bad cigarettes are. That's a behavioral problem, not an education problem. Everybody mm-hmm. knows they need to eat more vegetables. It really makes sense when you use these common examples of like smoking and eating vegetables and exercising, but it's the same with the environment, right? People know that there's all these things that they could do better but we really have to use a behavioral science approach, not an educational approach. So you've got all of these government bodies, not-for-profits, startup entrepreneurs wanting to do some social impact thing. And uh, people will be like, well, we have to make a documentary. We have to write a book. Let's hold a conference. Let's hold an event. Let's make YouTube. Uh, Let's make a podcast. Not that any of these things people should stop doing them, but people should really be uh, really shrewd in understanding that there's not a very strong causal link to making a fabulous documentary that really explains something and then that documentary leading to people doing anything. As the seasons change, it's important to get ahead of taking care of your immune health. It takes about 30 days for your body to adapt to new nutrients, so now is a great time to update your vitamin and wellness routines to help support your immune system this fall. And that's where CareUp comes in. CareUp is a wellness brand that makes it easy to maintain your health goals with a customized vitamin plan that helps you feel your best today and supports you long term. Care-of's in-depth five-minute online quiz asks you questions about your diet, lifestyle, and health concerns to help address your specific wellness goals. It's like getting a one-on-one consultation with a nutritionist without ever leaving your house. When I took the quiz, it was simple, and I was amazed by how personalized their recommendations were for my needs. You can customize your pack based on whether you want to sleep better, have more energy, or reduce stress, and your recommendations come in daily, individual, wrapped packets that are perfect for getting back into a routine. For 50% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter the code creative50. Again, for 50% off your first care of order, go to takecareof.com and enter the code creative50. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny you say that because, you know, I think about this from conferences, from audiobooks, from podcasts, from online courses, and this is something I've mentioned before, and maybe you can address this for me. Um, 
it, I feel like when it comes to attempting to change behavior using content of any sort, whether this is a conference, and this is one of the things I've struggled with with our own conferences, is I I, I kind of have to wrestle with the fact that wow, like maybe nobody's behavior is going to change. But I, I feel like you see sort of three gr- groups of people who you know basically can f- consume this inf- type of information that they're hoping to lead to some sort of change. They're the people who I think they'll get the result whether they found that thing or not because that's just the way that they're built. Like you know, I've interviewed Elon Musk's ex wife. She's like Elon Musk isn't sitting around reading self help books to get himself motivated um you know he just is and then you get the second group who i think that these kinds of things can be a catalyst for like they take knowledge transform it or take information transform it into knowledge and eventually into wisdom which leads to action and then you have this third group which i think the entire personal development industry is built off of uh you know i mean it's, it's how the people who get addicted to landmark end up going to spend all their life and all their money on landmark and it's the same for virtually every sort of self-improvement cult out there so I wonder, uh, is there a way to break that cycle? You mean the cycle of people getting like, addicted to self-help? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Or, or people who basically <sighs> don't change as a byproduct of what is effectively nothing but a lot of effort to try to change themselves. Okay. Well, my specialty isn't really people changing themselves and self-help. It's people making yeah. actionable change in the world. So I can answer the question through the yeah, lens feel- of... Yeah, what no. I know, because I'm not really sure how, if people have already spent a hundred grand on Landmark, yeah. how, I wrote, I'm not quite sure about that, um, about that space. But in terms of people having a value system and then turning that into real and measurable change, uh, there's a lot of really simple things that you can actually do if you're in the space of looking at your own life or you're a, um, a social impact entrepreneur. One example I like to use that's a really simple one is, a uh, pledges like you can write like if I write a promise to you like I'm gonna Mm. it can be to eat more vegetables or to quit smoking or it can be I in the next two years I will trade my car my fuel car in for an electric vehicle or I will put solar on my roof right Mm -hmm. uh if I just write it out to you like dear Srini I pledge to do blah 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 in whatever time frame and I give it to you I've created a promise and what works is that we're all essentially social beings. So we're all at the core of the human being is our social connections. You know, back however many thousands of years ago, if you got exited by the tribe or even, uh, you know, by a city, you would just die. So being, being socially rejected Mm -hmm. is actually created, created death. So, so core to who we are is the social creating strong social bonds. So if I create a trust bond with you, which is keeping my word, that yeah. is so powerful. I don't even need to give you the letter. I can just write it myself and you never know about it. And just that wow. mental process of making a promise uh-huh. is so powerful. It'll do more than watching 10 documentaries on the thing, right? Wow. So that's just something that doesn't cost any money. You can just be at an event yeah. and you can just ask somebody. I've tried it a few times and it really works. It's kind of scary. I stopped doing it because it was so powerful because I felt like I was being <laughs> excessively manipulative. Yeah. I got people to agree to things that they didn't really want to do and then they did it and then they felt it was almost like it was too strong. So I thought, I'm mm-hmm. not going to do this in my social world anymore. Um, <laughs> That's hilarious. So just write it down and uh, yeah. and it really works. Like I did it at a meetup once and I got all these people to write it down and then take like a photograph and I put it on Instagram and every almost every one of them sent me pictures. And I didn't ask people to send me pictures a week later. But they did. They went, here's my homemade toothpaste. Here's my coffee cup. Every day I'm at Starbucks. I brought my own coffee cup every single day. And I was like, this is phenomenal, you know, like all from just with a pen and paper, right? Yeah. So it's almost, but you have to understand it theoretically from the, the understand the behavioral science of the human bond. And when Mm -hmm. you understand that academic framework, you can come up with really cool ideas like that. You're like, hey, everybody, we're going to, instead of just a conference where we talk about climate change, everybody does their little pledge, you know, and then we photograph it and put it on the wall. And then Uh uh, you can, you've actually got real change happening than just, just a conference. Um, There are like, I don't know, like 20 more I can keep, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> like I said, there's, there's way too much for us to cover for us to spend. But I, I, I think that to me, like I said, I mean, I know that your work isn't about, you know, changing human behavior, but on some level, I feel like it is because you're changing human behavior to produce a result of some sort, not necessarily in their own behavior, but to produce some sort of external result. So I think it was absolutely relevant. Um, I think that, you know, you, you talk about two other, a few other areas here in this idea of mistakes. And, and this is one that really struck a chord with me because we recently did, uh, you know, uh, attempted to do a book writing workshop and realized we 
this is this was our biggest mistake. You say ideas first, data second is a mistake, and you talk about this information deficit hypothesis, and I, and I realized I was like, yeah, we we absolutely did not pay attention to the data, and I, I remember telling my friend, I was like, I don't care how optimistic you are if there isn't product market fit, then you're not going to use the law of attraction to convince somebody to buy something they don't want. Um, yeah, the idea with the ideas first, data second, which is when people are thinking about how they want to positively impact the world. And there is mm-hmm. a strong nexus here between self-development and changing the world because I think when everyone steps into their highest calling, they want to change the world, right? I, you know, as you progress further and further on self-development, you start thinking about a more and more altruistic meta type of world improvement. You know, once you've got yourself improved, you want to improve mm-hmm. everybody else. So they, they do your spiritual journey and change and fixing the world sort of start to become one at some, at some point. Uh, well, what people do is that they're always, they think you can just pluck ideas out of the ether. You know, it's like, Oh, like, Oh, I've got an idea. Why don't we start an uh, organic cafe that, that's on bicycles. That'd be so cool. Then we can ride the cafe around on electric bicycles and we can make electric powered uh, vegan ice cream, you know, something that'd be cool, cool idea, you know, or we'll make a whole other, like a, a Facebook plugin for whatever, um, Silicon Valley, social change ideas, all of it. People just randomly come up with ideas without understanding the causal link, causality. That's the big yeah. word here. Do you, does your idea have a causal link on the thing you want to change? If you had to do an academic paper on it and you had to really explain why it works to change the numbers, uh, would you be able to? Would you be able to do that? So what yeah. my book teaches is you flip it around and I don't come up with any ideas yet. Just look deeply at the data. If you're trying to affect energy efficiency, if you're trying to affect people changing water, if you're trying to get people exercising, whatever, then you really understand the data and the research about that first and then mm. draw your ideas from looking into the data and you will have so much better ideas. This is this nexus between measurement and creativity that I'm so passionate about that you can actually draw creativity through looking at the numbers. And when you start looking at the numbers, you're just like, oh, my God, look at that. That thing goes like that. And, oh, my God, we really need to be doing this. And, yeah. oh, look at that gap. You know, like one of the things, insights I had by doing that, I was looking at the energy efficiency of different households, just a big spreadsheet I downloaded from the energy government website. And I saw that the more people lived in a house, people's energy consumption per capita almost halved. So if you've got one person living in a single dwelling, Mm -hmm. if you just put two people in that, basically per person, it goes just about in half, you know, and then if you put three people living together, it's almost like a third, you know, it's basically almost like the extra person you add into the house. They uh-huh. almost make no, they make marginal addition, they use up marginal additional extra energy. So yeah. then you realize that actually living in one person per house is one of the most, uh, the, the worst things you can do for your own carbon footprint. So then mm. I started thinking more about communal living. I was like, well, the art of energy efficiency is communal living. Like, and in all my time doing environmental stuff, I'd never heard anyone talk about that because people hadn't really looked at the, at the data. People are always like, drive a Prius, you know. <laughs> I'm like, You've just got to live with a whole bunch of people, 10 people in the house, sleep on yeah. a bunk. Like, uh, and I just, and I started thinking about these new architectural models for how you could mm-hmm. do that. You know, you could have people sleep in little pods, like a beehive. You sleep in a little, like, you know, a cell, like a, like a, um, yeah. like a bee in a hive. Came up with uh, this whole property development idea called the beehive. Maybe it'll happen one day. Uh, and I was like, you know, we really need a whole new way of property development that accounts for lots of people living living together. But anyway, it was a whole new realm of creativity I entered into and imagination uh, and potentially entrepreneurship that would not have come if I was not studying a yeah. very boring government spreadsheet. So that's what everybody got to do. They got to look at the numbers, deeply understand them. And then uh-huh. what I teach is like a mind mapping process. So you look at the numbers, you write the number of what you want to achieve, and then you just mind map. Not one idea, but a hundred ideas. You just keep going. Mm-hmm. What ideas are going to shift these numbers? What ideas are going to shift these numbers? And you will have yeah. a thousand times better quality ideas doing that than just trying to like lie on a beach and be like, mm-hmm. you know, like pedal powered vegan ice cream van, you know, um, although that wouldn't be fun, but it may not actually measurably affect anything. Yeah. Well, I think that that was one of the things that really struck me about this book, even though, you know, like, I mean, even when you wrote in, you know, I thought, okay, there's a story about creativity here. But when I started reading it, I thought, wow, this is a very data driven approach to creative problem solving, which I, I really like because I, I, you know, skeptical to a fault about things that are based not on any research or data. Uh you know, so there's a sort of balancing act, right? Because I think with creativity, there's a 
intuitive component of you know creating what you want to see exist in the world um, and not necessarily just creating to be validated by an audience because that you know i mean i wrote an entire book about this and at the same time i think that what we know from every domain from athletics to science to you know business is that measurement improves performance we know that uh, you know, Dan Kennedy talks about this. He's like, you know, if you want to become wealthy, measure the amount of money that you're making. Like he's just, you know, he said, even if it's not what you want, just the act of measuring it actually changes your behavior, uh, towards it. And I, I've noticed that in my own life. And even uh, Fred Wilson, the venture capitalist has a blog post on his blog about this. He said that unanimously across all the people that he's invested in himself and the most successful people he knows, uh, they measure. Uh, like he has a the post is titled track and measure. Um, and you actually, I think your explanation of measurement was one of the best I've ever seen. Um, so I'd love to get into it because I mean, you kind of talked about this in, in a couple of detail, quite a bit of detail. You talked about defining the problem, determining your God metrics, uh, researching your numbers deeply, working out how you measure it and, and writing it all on the wall. Can you kind of give us an overview of how measurement might apply to uh, some sort of creative project. Let's you know, let's say we're using the podcast as an example. Um, you know, maybe the exact problem being okay. The problem we're trying to solve is how to reach a bigger audience. Okay. Well, the first uh, step for that is just going um, back from the podcast to the value action gap. Yeah. That a podcast, although it is a, a wonderful medium, is not a god metric. So the context, could I change the example a little bit? Please, to, yes, um, absolutely. Okay, yeah. let's say the podcast is about trying to get people to use less trash. Okay. Let's say that's your theme, right? Zero waste living, eco-friendly living, uh, how to, you know, glass straws, vegan, whatever. Okay, mm-hmm. if that's kind of part of our the kind of realm we're in. Yeah. So we look at a podcast and we say, well, a podcast is – it's a, it's a great thing for sharing ideas and getting creating a human connection, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not a god metric because it is a, a content space. It doesn't create um, what I call real world data. So when I use the word real world data, I'm talking about like quantitative kind of three dimensional matter. So mm-hmm. that means with trash, it's like pounds of trash, actual pounds of trash. It could be like yeah. numbers of trees. It could be kilograms of body weight on somebody. It could even be time saved. That's like a real, you know, a real metric. Mm-hmm. Liters of water, um, parts per million of a toxic chemical. So if you if you think you're making a um a, a podcast to get, you know, less trash in landfills, less trash in the ocean, yeah. you would be like, well, I'm really falling deep down the value action gap because people didn't listen to the podcast. They could love it. And then they may not do anything about it whatsoever, right. probably, right? Okay. So we'll move to the first step is to measure what we want to change. So what you would do is ask people to actually just measure how much trash they make. How much plastic are you buying? Why don't you make a chart on the wall showing how many plastic items you buy every week in packaging, in throwaway packaging? You yeah. know, maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100, you know, maybe it's just a couple, right? Most people are probably buying you know like several hundred you know disposable packaging items a month right Mm -hmm. so you could make like a big wall chart and you could put you could write every single one down you know you wouldn't do it forever maybe you do it for a month just as an exercise or you get a little scale and then you weigh it right Mm -hmm. one startup idea i've been working on is actually to put the scale on the garbage truck so the garbage truck actually measures it for you and then sends you the data Mm -hmm. uh anyway but that doesn't exist yet so yeah. Let's say you're just asking people to to measure it. Maybe they photograph it. Maybe it's just a visual thing. To take, they take a photograph of their garbage and then they, you know, stick it on the wall or they do like a little like Instagram process or something. So the process is just um, is just measuring that. And mm-hmm. then once you're monitoring it, one of the pages in the book just says put the number really big on the wall. Like yeah. a lot of these numbers are very hidden, especially about our environmental footprint. It's totally invisible. Nobody knows how much trash they make. Nobody knows. Do you know how much, like uh, the last shower you had, or how much water it used? No, of course not. <laughs> um, or do you know how many kilograms of CO2 you made last year, 2018? Nope. Don't have a clue. Nobody knows, right? All yeah. of this stuff is, um, and it's actually hard to figure out. It's not like you can yeah. just Google it. You have to read all these papers and download spreadsheets and figure it out. So just putting it on the wall, really big, not tiny, big, Mm -hmm. giant poster. You can do it electronically if you want to make an app that does it electronically Um, in real time. Cool. But you can just do it with a pen and paper too. That's why all the stuff in my book, you can either do high tech or low tech. If you're a serious Silicon Valley entrepreneur, 
do it with code. If you just want to do it with pen and paper, you do it that way. Um, and then as you monitor it, then you can start doing like basic type of graphical representations of the data. Like you can just create a progress bar where you are now, where you want to go. Okay. I'm making, you know, maybe, um, uh, the average is about 4.4 pounds of trash, I think a week. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at that, let's say you make 4.4 pounds, um, American average. And then you say, well, I want to get to zero. You make a progress bar. Just draw it on the wall, on the whiteboard. Here we am now. Here's where we want to go. And then every week as you get closer, you just put a line on your progress bar as you get there. And then instantly you will start doing what it takes, taking the actions because you'll be like, I really want to get my progress bar forward. I really want to get my progress bar forward. And if you've got a group of people, maybe there's like a team at a, a work or a school, you know, uh-huh. you can give out people like stickers. Seriously, this works. People study this. You give people a strawberry sticker, <laughs> you know, like just one that you buy at the store. Like it's so easy. Or even like a gold star, you know, gold star, you did the best. And then you can rank people. That's incredibly powerful if you've got a little group of people. You can rank people by the the trash, size of their trash, the however many plastic items they're buying. And people are very powerfully moved by being ranked, Right. But you can mm-hmm. still have your podcast. Doesn't mean your podcast needs to stop, but then you want to do it with these other tools here, these measurement-based tools that lead to action. So making it really obvious for everybody, if you can use a real-time feedback loop, make sure that people can see the data immediately like a Fitbit, uh-huh. using positive rewards like stickers, you know, it can be a real world like free veggie burger, but it can also just be like a, like a little butterfly sticker that you buy at the store. Uh, and then ranking is really powerful. And then you can add color as well, especially if you add everyone and then the people at the bottom are like red and they're like, why am I red? Why did I get the red sticker? You know, like, and they got the green one. I want to get the green one, you know, and then you'll find you've got this whole um, mechanism for people to drive behavior. So they listen to podcasts, they're like, cool, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, it gets them like emotionally primed and then you give them the actual mechanism for creating change and then whew, they're doing stuff. So that's my answer for how to take a podcast and turn it into something that would combine with a way that would create action. Wow. I love that. Um, So it's funny because I think we covered like three different sections of of the book in one (laughs) sort of example. uh, You you basically effectively talked about setting a goal and measuring it and all of that. So I was thinking, I was like, oh, this could go really long if we didn't get that. Then you get into sort of three components that I thought were really interesting about, you know, you talk about visualizing your world, you know, idea storms and idea evaluation. Um, you know, you mentioned this sort of three prong approach to visualizing your world, which is imagine, reverse engineer and create. And I think, you know, in, in some ways we've kind of done that, um, through the examples that we just talked about, would you say that's correct? Uh, and if, if not, can you kind of just expand on, on sort of a basic example of those three things? Oh yeah. Well, what we were talking about earlier in the, in our conversation about the creative process is applying that to how you want to build a new world. Now you may have noticed that people can be pretty doom like about mm-hmm. the future of the planet there's yeah. a lot of doom narrative about climate change right now um but it's kind of always been there you know the world's gonna die that kind of thing mm-hmm. and that does not create the optimal creative mind for coming yeah. up with how to change the world we need to do really complicated shit to try and fix the world like big complicated government carbon taxation systems new inventions um new social norms like there's a lot of difficult stuff to do. And if you're in a doom loop of thinking, that mm-hmm. is not optimizing your mind to come up with the ideas and the innovations necessary to, yeah. and, the, and the inner drive, just the actual emotional drive to do this stuff because it's, it's difficult to do, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so to step out of the doom loop, you want to step into the imagination optimism loop. You want to be able to imagine the future world instead of being like, Polar bears are dying. We're all going to die. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Everything's terrible. You drove a car. You're a really bad person because you drove a car and you just ate a hamburger. Like, oh my God, you ate a hamburger. I am never going to be your friend again. You know, it's a lot of like people can get in that mindset. You want to move out of that and start imagining in a hundred world, a hundred years, what world do you want? Mm -hmm. You know, if you want one of my favorite things to think of is a world that's covered in like green cities, like covered in trees. So if you were to fly a plane over the city, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the forest and the city because it would be covered in vegetation, right? Mm. So, and that's a, a real thing that actually has to happen for us to survive. We need a lot more plants, plant life in cities. Yeah. So I think about, oh, you know, cities would be covered in green roofs and then, um, you know, children would grow their own 
fruit and vegetables at school and or maybe everything you know just you just cast your mind into an imagination space of the beautiful future positive reality mm-hmm. and that's a, a critical thing to do to create um, optimism and a vision and to get ideas from yeah and you know since I learned how to do this since I started doing this my just whole headspace is different I used mm-hmm. to be more in the other way of thinking that's kind of how you start we all start in that yeah. and then I started thinking about like wow imagine if I just walked down a city street and there were just cherry blossoms everywhere and there was art and there was children playing and there were no cars anymore and trash had gone extinct and there were every building had a little forest on top of it I'm like that would be amazing that's the world that I want to build and you just get into a completely different headspace and get this really positive energy and you mm-hmm. start coming up with ideas you know better better ideas of what to do yeah uh, and that's kind of the creative loop that you want to be in with vision and optimism to change the world. That's your creative space you want to be in. And that's why yeah. creativity is the, that you can't save the world without entering into a creative process. It's one and the same thing. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. So it's funny because I'm looking at the mind map of that and I, I'm looking at this visualize your world you know, thing with three prongs. And I'm like, wow, I could apply this to like every other part of my life as well. Yeah, like it's like okay imagine what your social life is like you know reverse engineer what it would take to create that and then create it uh which is mind-boggling to me when i'm looking at this i had never thought of it that way but then you you also go into idea evaluation which i thought was really interesting because again we come back to a, you know a data-driven approach to things where you ask you know people to score the impact of their ideas score the cost of the idea assign a value metric rank the ideas um shortlist and choose your favorite ones so can you can you explain how we might do that Let, let's to you know, take the idea of, of something, let's say something like writing a book or a creative project of some sort. Is there a way we could walk through an example of that, that some, you know, is a bit more different than the one we just talked about? Uh, yeah, well, again, you know, like a book or a creative project to make sure we don't fall down the value action gap, mm-hmm. creative projects and books can very easily do that if their intent is to create change. Yeah. So let's say the creative project of the book is about how to create more green cities covered in vegetation, right? That's mm-hmm. one of my favorite things, favorite yeah. things to think about. So instead of you're <laughs> like, okay, I want to, I want to, um, I want to create more green roofs, more plants in cities. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to create a book about green roofs, you yeah. know, book about green roofs. And you might create a really nice book about green roofs, you know, but and even it might sell a lot, but then mm-hmm. it might not actually make anyone build a green roof. Right. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, this is again all about causality. So that step, which is the, the step of idea evaluation in the, in the book, is getting really shrewd about the causal link. So mm-hmm. you would look at the the data. You can do it through satellite images, the green space in a city. You look at a city, look at all the data where the green space is, where it isn't. Do your mind map of like, okay, my city is like fourteen percent green space, and then start mind mapping ideas. How do I get more green space? Do I go to a property developer? Do I ask schools to do it? Do I go to old basketball courts and see if they rip them up? Maybe I go to like IKEA and Safeway and try and figure out how they put on green roofs. I mean, you just look at the numbers and you mind map, mind map, mind map uh, all that out, and then you look at all your ideas, and then you think. And one of those ideas is write a book about green roofs. You know, maybe make YouTube. Make mm-hmm. a podcast about green roofs. You put your content ideas in there as well, all the ideas you can think of. And then you start looking, well, which one has the strongest causal link to getting people to put in more green roofs? Yeah. You know? And you maybe your book might very much be in there. You're like, okay, I want to write a book. But the book, then you'll think, okay, instead of just writing a book the way everybody else wrote a book, mm-hmm. maybe I'll write a book. I'm just like thinking off the top of my head here. Maybe I'll write a book that actually has a map of my city and each book per maybe suburb is different like you do a slightly different one maybe mm-hmm. it's like a more of a booklet you know maybe just it's only like um 20 pages or something almost like a tutorial guide and then you put in the map of your suburb and then you isolate in like a bright color where all the existing green spaces were you put a progress bar in that says okay we're at 14 percent. we really want to get it up to like 50 percent mm-hmm. and then you list all of the organizations to call you know community groups etc and then you say you know help us get your face on the map. We're going to do another one in, in like six months. Put your face on the map, take a photo of yours, put it on Instagram. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe you make an app that people can like tag themselves and put it on because people like to take selfies and be seen and, um, you know, doing things and all of that. And you completely create your booklet into an action guide about mm-hmm. a specific community 
And you're like, come on, everybody, we want to get our progress bar up to 50% green space. That is the mission here. And everything you do in your marketing is yeah. all about creating that measurable goal. So you go from something very similar to a book to a booklet and community campaign, and then you make it so it can be replicated in different different towns. So you're taking kind of a different, a, a more creative, more different approach to mm-hmm. um, the way books have always been always been done. And people can download it from the website. So you see what I mean? Like you can just take a conventional concept and just tweak it and make something right. that actually has impact. Wow. Wow. Uh, this is this is kind of amazing because like a data driven approach to to making real meaningful impact, which I love. Uh, so in the next section, you know, we've alluded to some of this and, and we've got hit certain parts of this, uh, in our conversation so far, you know, which is about changing behavior. I mean, we've, you know, talked about actors, actions, measurement. One thing you, you talked about here was user story mapping, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, can you walk us through, you know, what is, what exactly that is and, and how it plays a role in, in the work that we do? Oh yeah. User story mapping is like the, like the most important thing you can do. It's used very commonly in software development. If anyone's listening and they've done, uh, any kind of like software development or UX design, Mm -hmm. they've done this, but unfortunately, because people's careers tend to get siloed, this has not spilled out into the entire not-for-profit government world. Mm -hmm. Hardly anybody's ever heard of it. So it's really simple. You just draw. Like I like to do it with a stick figure. People usually do it with post-it notes, but I'm more of a stick figure mind map kind of gal. Yeah. Uh, so if you're looking at, let's say it's the green city idea, mm-hmm. instead of kind of boxing yourself into a, a book and doing books the way everybody always has done books, you do it. Start off doing it. Use a story map. So you'll draw a picture of a little person, and then you'll be like, "Well, here we go. He what what." wakes up in the morning and then, you know, drives to work, goes to work at a building, you know, eats lunch, breakfast, coffee, whatever, does things, drives home, another building, long freeway, you know. Who is your, like, type of person? And then you illustrate how they go through their day. Mm -hmm. And then at what stage you can intervene in that to create the action that you want them to create. So if this is, like, a person, it could be just, say, an office worker, let's say you use Uh that example. Yeah. You could be like, well, I, how can I empower the office worker to push their company to cover their roof in greenery? That would be one type of person. Mm. Let's say it's, for example, something like like safe, like big stores, like um, a Safeway, IKEA, those kind of like big box stores, right? Mm-hmm. You could be like, well, I want to get. You go like, okay, they've got a big. They take up a lot of land. So they would be a really good candidate for this. So you've got the employees. So you do a stick figure for them. You've got the uh, executive people who are in power over the building, like the building managers and the corporate executives. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you've probably got the community, like the people who buy things, the shoppers. Yeah. Uh, you've got the surrounding residents. And I don't know, who else would you have Would you have in that mix? Maybe like the town planners. Maybe there's mm-hmm. something to do with people that approve building permits, um, the mayor, whatever, local environmental organizations. Yeah. And so you would just say all of those people as they go through their day, as they wake up in the morning, and then you go, what is the action you want them to take that will most make this thing come true? Mm -hmm. So if it's an office worker, it would be like, okay, we want them to send an email to the corporate executive or the building manager, you know, the head of architecture or whatever. I don't know who that person is, but um, to ask them to do this. And maybe it's got a cool picture. It's got, this is what, you know, Ikea would look like covered in vegetation, you know, yeah. um, old Ikea, new Ikea. They, they, and so you empower the employees. Then the executives, it'd be like, well, this is how you get a quote. This is who you would, the local suppliers. And then the employees, maybe you do like a social media sharing, like, hey, like here's a social media share, you know, so you show that there's community traction for the idea. And you just like w- do the little stick figure walking through, you know, and that will illustrate for you what you have to do. That will totally unveil to you your startup idea or your community action campaign. Mm, wow. And it's amazing. You can't not do it. It's yeah. the best. Wow. That is, that is wild. Uh, so like I said, I mean, I think that the amount of depth that you go into in all of this stuff is probably way too much to cover, <laughs> even in our conversation. But I think that the other one that I wanted to spend some time talking about was systems thinking, because it, it's funny, you know, I think that when, when people think about creative work, they, I, I think one of the smartest things I ever saw about creative work was that um, it was something David Brooks said about, you know, work like an accountant, but think like an artist. 
Uh, and, and to me, that was very clear that, you know, systems are, are critical to even creative work. I know because, you know, I taught an entire course about designing systems for creativity. So, uh, but, but I mean, your sort of dissection of systems was really in depth and detailed. Can you give us sort of an overview of, of this concept of systems thinking and, and how it might apply to any problem that we're trying to solve? Well, the idea of systems thinking, which is, it's a bit of a nebulous kind of, kind of concept, but it just means how can you affect the system to create lots of individuals rather than just asking people, right? And I think, let's say, getting people to eat more vegan food would be a great example. If you think the best way to get people to eat more vegan food is to just get people one-on-one to go vegan, Mm -hmm. you're thinking in an individual bias kind of way, like one person at a time, right? And that's a kind of like a bit of a slower, much slower, kind of less effective way to change things. Mm -hmm. If you start thinking of a systems way, you might think of, well, how can I affect a thousand people at a time? How can I affect a million people at a time? Yeah. So that could be something like um, maybe I could get all the schools, every school in a, in a city or in a whole state, what about all the schools in a whole state, to make a commitment to serving no more than 10% of their calories in the school meet, right? Mm-hmm. That would be a system thinking. So you actually embed low meat into the, the entire system. So it's just starting, at first it's just starting to get people to think more like that instead of how can I affect one person at a time? Not that you shouldn't affect one person at a time, but just to start to think about if you're going to be, this is going to be your full-time work, it's, it's going to be your baby, it's going to be the next 10 years of your life, you really want to be thinking about how you can influence large amounts of people to take action. And uh, there are different ways that you can do that, like looking at the defaults. One of the examples in the book is through organ donation. It's a pretty commonly known example in uh, like behavioral science. But if you, in America, they ask people, do you want to donate organs, you know, in a car accident on your driver's license thingy, yes or no? And people tend to click no more often. Wow. So it has quite low organ donation rates because you get the option to click yes or no. Whereas in many other countries, it's already assumed yes. They say, would you like, they change the form to say, would you like to opt out of organ donation? So you then have to actively tick the box that says, I'm opting out. And if you do nothing, you're in. So the default is set. So that's an idea of looking at the whole system rather than trying to do some big campaign to be like, donate your organs, Mm -hmm. contact the DMV, you know. They just kind of create this very minor change in the system. And then when you do that, you have like 99% organ donation rates as opposed to only about 40% that you have in in America. Mm -hmm. And another example is, um, I think I put this in the book, like a, like say airplanes, you know, food and airplanes. Yeah. And at the end with the vegan example, instead of having to be like the one person who has like the vegetarian meal, you know, like why don't they just make all the meals vegetarian and then you have to opt in to get like a meat meal, right? Mm -hmm. That would be an example and that would instantly change all the thousands of planes flying all over the world to be uh, low meat or no meat yeah. um, aircraft without having to do this process of like one person at a time, you know, going vegetarian. Uh-huh. You can uh, look at these system-wide interventions. So it's kind of obvious when you think about it, but a lot of people haven't quite got their head into that space of like are your ideas individual bias mm. or are you really looking at the system of how you can affect thousands of people at a time through the design of the system? Mm. Wow. Wow. Uh, well, you know, there's so much here that, I, I, like I said, I mean, I feel like if we really did a deep dive into each one of these topics, it would take us three hours. Uh, it does. That's how long my big workshop takes. It's exactly three hours. Yeah. No, <laughs> you go through every single one. Well, like I said, I mean, I, I, I sat down with a book and I, I just, every time I got to a section, I was like, wow, like we could literally do an episode on every one of these sections because they're so in depth. I mean, it was hands down one of the best sort of idea explanations I'd ever, it, like, you know, I've read a lot of books about creativity, but I think the fact that there was so much thought behind sort of this data-driven approach to how you actually bring about real change was really, really uh, insightful. So um, I want to finish with with one final question, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? What do I think that makes, can you define unmistakable? Yeah. So, you know, for the purposes of a book that I wrote, I was forced to define it. And I define unmistakable as something that nobody else could have done but you, something that is so distinctive that 
you don't even have to put your name on it. It's recognized as something you did. Well, I believe very strongly that every person has this unique creative essence or light or spark inside of them. And the meaning of life and our purpose here on the earth is to cultivate that, get us, get it out of us and use it to do the most good we can in the world. Mm. That's actually what I wake up every morning. And I think that is my, my first priority, not to hit the gym or to check my emails, but to be like, how can I use my unique creative force to do the most good I can? And I try and hit that for a couple of hours every morning and just whatever that comes over me. And I think everybody has that that essence. And when you really get in the driver's seat of that way of thinking mm-hmm. and you really start to believe in yourself that you have this unique thing, uh, it allows you to do work that is unique to you. And everybody has a different genetic profile. Everybody's born in a different place in a different time, a different place in their own family dynamics. So we really actually are all different in our what we can bring to the world. So the more that you get into that and make it purely about your creative flow that's unique to you, Mm -hmm. you can step out of the driver of the the kind of like success and failure narrative wherever you on this imaginary linear line of how successful or how failure you feel and just focus on on flow and expression. Mm. And so when I think when people are able to do that, then they're unmistakable. They're not trying to be like, how do I get to a million Instagram followers or how do I make my first million dollars or how do I get the perfect body or how do I be like a success? Mm -hmm. You just step out of that and into unique, your unique fingerprint, creative flow. When you see people do that, you're like, that's awesome. That's you. You know, that's killer because nobody can repeat it. Nobody can replicate that inside you. You, That will be your thing, your unique thing. And I think it's quite hard to do because there's so many forces in the world that make you try and take you away from that. I think you've got to really ruthlessly, ruthlessly go at that. So that's my answer. That's how to be unmistakable. Amazing. Uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your insights with our listeners. Uh, where can people find out more about you, your work, the book, and everything else that you are up to? No worries. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you can, I would urge people to join my website, which is katiepatrick.com, spelled K-A-T-I-E. Uh, sometimes my accent, people get that off. Um, and I have a whole bunch of free downloads that can help you get more insight, you know, little tutorials and stuff um, that is fun to sign up. And there is a button on there that will direct you to get the book from Amazon or you can get it from the Indiegogo campaign. Uh, if you get it from Indiegogo, I think it costs a little bit less and you can also get the ebook and the audio book all in one. So that's a good, a good deal. And I have a, a podcast that's also called How to Save the World, which has interviews with some academics that go into, if you're a really deep kind of behavioral sustainability nerd and you want the deep academic dive, there's some episodes on there that do that that you might enjoy if you want some more, um, some more deep insight. And it was just at Katie Patrick at Twitter as well. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.